2300 Gear Jammer channel. I'm pretty excited to not be doing wiring for a change, so uh, really happy. We're gonna call this 97% done. I still need to add the connectors on the wiring for the water pump, fan, and fuel pump, but when I mount the fuel pump final, I'll finish the wiring for it. Only take a second at that point. And uh, maybe a ground on the engine. Now that I said that, I've, let's call it 96%. So. Uh, in the last video, somebody put in the comments that Ron Francis sells a battery disconnect that also has an alternator interrupt. So that's super helpful. I really like that. I went ahead and installed that before we got started today. And the way the battery kill switch works, you're supposed to be able to have the engine running, shut the kill switch off, and all the power, both to the dash, the switches, ignition, alternator, everything shuts off all at once. And more commonly than not, people don't wire the alternator right and the alternator circuit will backfeed everything else and it will keep itself running. It's really hard on electronics. So uh, I haven't wired the alternator. We'll get that after the thing's running, then it'll matter. But um, also uh, the headlight switch, the dome lights didn't work. That's right. So I put a, a headlight switch in it and the ignition switch had a weird little sticky spot. So I, I put a ignition switch in it too. These switches and the harness had been sitting outside for 15 years, so it's fine. Um, for this one though, I really, I'm just gonna have fun with uh, getting this thing ready to start. I'm gonna do all the stuff left, as much as I can anyway, to get it running. I think we need to figure out the drive shaft link, that's one thing. It's already got a 2.3 and a T5 in it, so stuff's pretty much sitting where it needs to be. If you look through the comments, there's a guy named 79 Beans. He leaves like six mile long comments, good stuff. He's guessing 44 and 3 quarter inch drive shaft, so I, he's locked in. I'm gonna say it's gotta be shorter than that. We'll see if he ends up being right. He just did one. And I need to pull the engine out and get an oil pan pickup tube, get the oil pan sealed, get all of that stuff done, get it back in the car, make sure there's no bell housing clearance. And I'm running a four cylinder bell housing, but I'll also run a V8 bell housing, which would be much bigger at some point. So I'll at least do the clearancing for it now so that I can put the car together and I can switch it back and forth as I want to. But uh, let's get into Let's do the check the drive shaft real quick before I pull anything apart. And then I'll pull the engine out and we'll get into some of that stuff. I, I'll go ahead and set another engine in for the bell housing checks and then, then we'll see what we need to do. This one was on the top of the stack. It's got a T5 slip yoke. Nothing on this end, which is perfect because that's how the Pinto is going to be. And it appears to be 45 and a half inches long. So this will be a good place to start. This should at least get into place and we can see what it looks like. I don't know what this one's out of. Uh, I think it was out of my SVO. It says OA5. Let's see how it fits. Oops. So this drive shaft is the one out of my SVO. Way back, uh, the aluminum drive shaft prices went through the roof. They used to be like 200 bucks and then they started to jump to three and up. So right as I thought that was gonna happen, I went and bought four or five used ones and uh, I think the SVO's got an aluminum drive shaft in it now, but let's see how this one fits in the Pinto. Oh, yeah, gone. I think he's correct. So this is an SVO drive shaft that's 45 and a half and bottomed all the way out in the transmission. It is pretty close, like it would work there, um, but with the articulation of the rear end, it's not gonna work out. So um, about an inch shorter than what's here is 44 and a half, and that's what he put in the comments. So, on it. If you wanna look super smart in the comments, put your guesses for the next thing. So, uh, I need to find something 44 and a half or less. So, good call, 79 beans. I don't have a drive shaft. I look through all of them. I've got at least 20 here, and they're all Fox Body Mustang or, or up to the Grand Marquis, so that'll give me something to be mad about while I'm doing the rest of this stuff. I was hoping I'd at least have a drive shaft. Pinto drive shaft doesn't work or anything, so uh, yeah, maybe one will turn up, but nothing so far. All right, so a couple of things that I noticed right off the get-go. That coil is going to be really, really close to hitting the hood depending on how the shape of the hood is. And it looks like there's gonna be, it's plenty of room with a 2-3 bell housing, but with a 5-0 one, I can see where it would be tight. There's a spot here. Tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and mark this stuff just so I know for a 2-3. That one, this one's plenty good, but I'm just gonna put uh, 
put where the bolt, bolt pattern is. This has got a pile of room. All right, I marked where the bell housing bolts are. Just general areas so I know what I'm looking at. And these are the factory engine mounts for 77 Pinto. That may change. I found these on tbirdcougarparts.com. It's adjustable, so side to side. Maybe I can use the different hole pattern and uh, that'll give me a little something to work with. These are super nice looking, pretty robust. So I'm going to pull the front clip off, pull the bumper off, lower it down on the jack stands. It's up a little bit too high. Get the engine out and uh, then I'll put another engine in that's already got a V8 bow housing on it. We'll see what needs to be adjusted. Maybe we'll go ahead and modify the firewall or adjust it a little bit. And uh, I've got a pretty scientific process for that. And then as soon as I get done with that, we'll go ahead and get all this stuff back in. We can at least set it into place after I fix the oil pump pan, seal it up. So, all right, here we go. going very well at all so the first thing when I set the engine in place I heard the other camera shut off right as the engine hoist went Rawr! and then it fell down into the engine compartment so that was solid second that bell housing is having nothing to do with fitting through that firewall so there's a split year I, I don't know if it was 71 to 73 was the better firewall I hope that's what it is this car is a 77 I would hate to think that the earlier runs worse than this I know there's a difference though I, I'm probably not gonna worry about this right now. I'm gonna mark it, which is kinda easy because it's got red paint all over it now. I'm gonna mark where it's hitting and uh, I'm gonna show you a pretty good trick that I use. It works a lot of the time. I don't think it's gonna work on this, but we're, we're just gonna get into it and see. Let me get the engine back out of the way and, and see what I can do with it. All right, while I've got the engine out, I'm gonna pull the power steering lines off. This is a power steering rack. And I'm going to take the lines off. I will cap them at some point, but they're easier to get wrenches to. And the steering column, I'm at least going to knock all this stuff loose. If you look, this is a rag joint. Fox Body Mustangs have them too. When they break, you get some crazy slop in the steering wheel. So I'm at least going to knock all that stuff loose. I may put a good steering shaft in this. Uh, it's a little rough, but it'll be fine while the car is slow. And at some point, some dummy took the bolt out of the steering rack. I don't think that one was me, but uh, go grab one off the other car and it'll be fine. So a couple of steering rack things while I've got the engine out and then I'll stick the engine back in real quick. Yeah. All right, so here's a really slick way to get your firewall clearance right on the first try. If you can see this mark, this is where it was hitting on this side and it's gonna be hitting like this on this side. So, the level, go point to point like this. And then this, go to 45 this way. We're gonna check it this way. We've got seven there. And now it's good to go. better. All right, so this engine, uh, I don't remember what it's out of. I just know that I probably spent upwards of $50 on it. Um, definitely not going to do a $10 oil filter. 
I'm going to see if I can go find a used oil pan gasket. I, I typically leave some hanging up that, that have been used, so uh, we'll do that. The Mustangs are a rear sump oil pan. The Pinto's a front sump, meaning all the oil sits in the front half of the pan. So you can use the same oil pump, but it takes a different pickup tube. So pickup tube and pan are different. Um, I've only got two, so I'm going to cobble stuff together. I think I've got a brand new pump and pickup tube but I'm definitely not going to use that on this one. Uh, we're just going to, I may not even dump the stuff out of the pan. We'll get it apart and see how bad it is, and I'm just going to use it. We'll see what happens. So I'm going to seal the oil pan, put it back in the car, see what needs to be hooked up. Yeah. So I found this brand new pickup tube. What's this number? This, I have no idea how long it's going to take. It's a little dusty. This is what they look like in the bag. I'm leaving it sealed in the bag because I really care about uh, trash that gets in the engine. So instead, I found this one. It took like 30 minutes to find. And there's my used oil pan gasket. And this pan is pretty rough. I'm gonna hit that with a little brake clean and I'm not gonna clean the rest. Nah. Nah, let's not worry about it. This whole thing's getting bad, so let's just put it together, worst case scenario, find out what happens. This just keeps getting worse. So the pump, I think this engine was a Mustang. Ah, I can't remember. Anyway, the little brace for the pickup tube hits, so I'm gonna have to use the Pinto oil pump. And made a mess on the floor. So it's gonna get, uh, I am actually gonna clean this up. I'm gonna leave the pump all crusty and I'm gonna put a new gasket on it. And that's our wishful thinking that this is ever gonna run. pumps on so uh, that goes in there yeah that sucks all right so when I'm doing this the daggone cameras keep overheating same as me so uh, oil pans back on I had to take the pump back off I really did I left the oil pump drive shaft out that wasn't a joke I'm going to put the engine back in. I'm going to put these uh, jazzy engine mounts on real quick, get everything set back in. And then we're going to have the most important part of this whole video. This and there, then important part. I said we would make it to the important part. So first, while I was looking for uh, oil pan bolts, which all these daggone two threes, and I, I had a bag of oil pan bolts. It took a while to find them. But while I was doing that, I found a Pinto book I didn't know I had. That's pretty exciting. And by chance, the old receipt that looks like it's as old as I am. Oh, uh, state inspection or something. It is the engine section and adjusting valves and that's good stuff. So when you look at this, it talks about what kind of oil you should run in the Pinto. And it's probably the most talked about topic. I have no idea why. People discuss what kind of oil to put in these things to no end. And uh, everybody's wrong, and I'm going to show you why. First, I don't mess around with that car. I said this probably a couple of times in the engine video for that. I don't mess around. I'm going to run Mobile One Extended Performance High Mileage... 5w20 right without question and i think the only thing that really matters is that it has oil in it so to prove that we're gonna run 5w20 
If you're new to the channel, you might be thinking, he's not really going to use that, is he? But if you've been around the channel a bit, you're probably thinking, huh, I'm surprised he puts Mobile One in the Grand Marquis. Anyway, uh, it's also weird that uh, these oil pans take four and a half quarts, and I also know that if I run the Grand Marquis for 7,500 miles, only uh, four and a half quarts come back out. <laughs> This thing is already dripping oil. Yeah, <laughs> go on it. <laughs> it's leaking in like three spots. Well, clearly that's the oil's fault. All right, I went ahead and hooked up the starter. It's been a terrible day. Let's see if it keeps going. And uh, I had to hook a jumper cable to ground from the starter solenoid because it needs a bracket, but let's see if it'll crank. Ah! I don't crank it too long, but... All right, so we got noise, if nothing else. It's cranking. Uh, I really didn't plan on that. I just... It was close, so I did that. Um, the oil pan, it's got a little hole in it. I don't know if I did that. I kind of dropped the engine. I don't know if I bumped it hard enough to poke a hole in the rust, but whatever. It, it's easy to get back out now. So uh, I did get the engine mount sort of locked down. They're really adjustable, which I don't particularly care for. It, it sort of has to be adjustable for all the different ways that people set an engine in. I may tack weld some pieces in there at some point just so that when I put it together, it's always in exactly the same spot. It doesn't matter before a turbo anyway, but... Um, and um, I'm not really sure what's next. You're gonna have to watch these videos close. In the next video, I will probably hook up all the fuel system, run the last wire, put fuel in it, prime it, make sure that that's good. And when it gets to that point, it could probably start at any day. Uh, if this were 10 years ago, I would just stay here, work all night, and we'd be driving it in the morning. But it's like 900 degrees, so I am gonna call it a day. And uh, that's it. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye.